Good evening, Davao. Good evening. Good evening, friends. I'm happy to be back, and we will continue our lecture on the um, very simple strategies on how to prevent and reverse diabetes, heart disease, and constipation. For the past nights, we were discussing some very simple strategies using dietary management, and we have discussed some very beautiful benefits on legumes, right, on vegetables and fruits. And tonight, I'd like to continue the lecture, and it is even deeper than just vegetables and fruits because the lecture tonight is about indigenous vegetables. When I say indigenous, it is locally grown vegetables, the vegetables that can be seen at the back of your um, garden at the back of your you know, residential areas and we can actually propagate this indigenous vegetable uh, but before I continue I'd like to show you a very important video short video and it's about Bill Clinton's protocol with the very special doctor Dr. Cadwell Elsestine and Dr. Dean Ornish so let's watch the video when I sat down with former President Bill Clinton this week in New York City at the Clinton Global Initiative, we spoke about the U.S. economy, the election, world affairs. But the part of the interview that grabbed so much attention was about his dramatic weight loss and the diet that helped him shed two dozen pounds. And I live on uh, uh, beans, legumes, vegetables, fruit. I drink a protein supplement every morning. I, no dairy. I drink almond milk mixed in with fruit and a protein powder. So I get the protein for the day when I start the day out. And it changed my whole metabolism and I lost 24 pounds. And I got back to basically what I weighed in high school. But I did it for a different reason. I mean, I wanted to lose a little weight, but I didn't ever dream this would happen. I did it because after I had this stent put in, I realized that even though it happens quite often that after you have bypasses, you lose the veins because they're thinner and weaker than arteries. The truth is that it clogged up, which means that the cholesterol was still calling buildup in my vein that was part of my bypass. And thank God I could take the stance. I don't want it to happen again. So I did all this research and I saw that 82% of the people since 1986 who have gone on a plant-based, no dairy, no meat of any kind, no chicken, turkey. I, I eat very little fish. Once in a while, I'll have a little fish. Not often. If you can do it, 82% of the people who've done that have begun to heal themselves. Their arterial blockage cleans up. The calcium deposit around their heart breaks up. Let's discuss uh, what the president, uh, former president, said. Uh, with the doctors behind the diet that helped the, uh, Mr. Clinton change his life. Uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn is the author of Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, and Dr. Dean Ornish is the author of The Spectrum. Uh, let me go to Dr. Esselstyn first. Uh, he mentioned both of you for inspiring him to begin this diet. Walk us through uh, this diet, Dr. Esselstyn. Why is this diet so good, especially for those individuals who have a history of heart disease? Well, thank you, uh, Will, for uh, having me on this evening with my good friend, uh, Dean Arnish. There's no question that if the truth were known that uh, coronary artery disease is a toothless paper tiger that need never exist. And if it does exist, it need never, ever progress. What we've heard from President Clinton is the remarkable change that he's been willing to make to remove completely from his, his uh, nutrition those foods which we know will devastate and injure the inner lining of your arteries. And the remarkable thing is the capacity that the body has to heal itself. And when you do what Pre President Clinton has done, where you completely try to remove any foods that are going to injure your vessel, the bar body has this remarkable capacity to begin to heal itself. And I'm afraid that as a medical profession, we perhaps have uh, fallen down and really emphasized too much the drugs and the procedures and the operations which really treat the symptoms. They do not treat the causation of this illness. Right. This is one of the few times since Hippocrates that we have not told patients about the causation of their illness. Uh, uh, Dr. Ornish, are you on the exact same page okay, as so Dr. Esselstyn Okay, so if you Esselstyn want to is? finish that film, 
Maybe you yes, can just I am. And get, I want to just say I love and respect have President the connection Clinton. in YouTube. You just press President Bill Clinton and Dr. Cadwell Elsestine, CNN News, and you'll get the, the YouTube. Uh, and I'm so excited, really, because these are now popular people following a plant-based diet. Now, we want to go deeper than just plant-based diet because we want sure healing. And this is so simple prescription. All we have to do is still go plant-based, but we have to go indigenous plant foods. Again, when I, said, when I say indigenous, it is locally grown plant foods. Now, I've been promoting all these indigenous plant foods in television, in radio, and I keep on shouting that, hey, Filipinas, you have to eat malunggay because malunggay is really so rich in nutrients. And I keep on saying that when I want to promote malunggay, it's by the thousand. When it comes to beta-carotene, let's try to see beta-carotene. I want you to memorize the figure. And this is how I educate the lay people. And it's like 13,000. 13,000. And 13,000 beta-carotene and calcium is 200. Okay? So calcium 200. So let's try to compare it. No. Sorry to tell you that I cannot promote meat. Definitely meat cannot heal. Meat can give you sickness. When it comes to fat, animal fats, obviously, these foods contain excess amount of fat, and the type of fat is not the good type, which is saturated, and it really carries cholesterol. Now, when it comes, for example, the pork, let's try to compare. Now, I want you really to open your eyes and try to compare which one is really best for you. Look, your pork, it has only 30, and calcium is 14, comparing it again to 13,000 and comparing it to 200. Now, again, I cannot promote shrimp and seafoods. Why? Because look, you cannot get health. You cannot get healing from this food. And look at the nutritional value, comparing it to 13,200. Now, it's only 10 and 76. Okay? So when it comes to reversal of diseases, it's easy. It's easy when you have the plant-based diet. Now, I want to go to other vegetables. What's this? Sino makakahula sa inyo nito? Oh, you're so good, huh? Ibig sabihin, you're eating ampalaya. That's ampalaya. Ampalaya, when it comes to the fruit, oh, it's even beyond 10 and 30 and, no, beyond the pork and the, the shrimp. But when it comes to leaves, look, leaves has 1,000, 3,000, and 300. So again, when it comes to management of reversal, vegetables should always be included. Here, what's that? People keep on saying that upo has no nutritional value, right? Now, when I was still young, I keep on hearing to the, from the old fox, oh, don't eat upo, it has no value, it has no nutritional value. But you know what? It's still okay because the nutritional value is still even higher than the pork and the shrimp. But when you go to the leaves, now look, it becomes thousands. So here comes the leaves and when you have, what's this? Oh, this is alugbate. What recipe can you, you know, can you cook for kalaw? What that? What's that? Lawoy. Very good. I salute to the lawoy Visayan dish. Uh, what other recipe can you do to alugbate? Huh? Salad. What else? Actually, you can cook anything, huh? And here comes the nutritional value of alugbate at very close to 4,000. And here comes the calcium. So it, is, it has an advantage. This is the reason why Dr. Cadwell and, you know, Doc, President Bill Clinton said, you can give the chance to your body to heal itself because of the nutritional, high nutritional content. Now, that's alogba. I really love alogbate. Now, when I teach this kind of thing to the kids, they, I would even ask them to shout, I love to eat Ah, look, buddy, and the kids would be shouting that one. And then later on, when they keep on saying that, wow, you will really be surprised. Kids can eat alug bate, huh? What's that? Eggplant. One day, my uncle visited us. He came from Georgia. And you know what? He said, 
you know what? I treated your auntie to the most expensive restaurant in Georgia. And it's an Egyptian restaurant, he said. And it's like, you know, in the States, if you have like less than $20, you have already eat all you can. But here, the uncle, my uncle, treated my auntie to the most expensive restaurant. And it's just, it's a little expensive. It's quite expensive because one dish is 200 US dollars per dish. And he said, oh, because you know, this uncle is a pathologist and he's really a very good pathologist in the States. And he said, oh, I have spent a lot for this special date. And when they went to the Egyptian restaurant and started looking for the dish for the special treat, you know, he can't find any, you know, he, he, he's never, never acquainted with the Egyptian dish and with the Egyptian name. And he started looking for the name. And finally, there was one dish with translation. And here comes the English translation. Food fit for the king. Oh, he said, oh, this is a very special dish. This is for my special wife. This is, I think, the best date. So he ordered for food fit for the king. And so they waited and waited. And finally, when the restaurant was about to serve the food, oh, it was actually on a golden platter, golden, you know, cover, the platter cover. And when they opened the platter, to their surprise, it was tortang talong. <laughs> so you ladies, when you go home and you cook talong to your husband, you charge them 200 US dollars. Huh? So what? Tortang talong? You know the tortang talong that we usually do with the stem, with the stalk? Yun na yun. <laughs> Sabi niya, ha, tortang talong, 200 US dollars. And it's a very special Egyptian dish. Okay, so here comes the talong, and I really love talong. You, know, you can make lots and lots of recipes to your talong. You can, wow, I've had a show with Rufa and I. That was during the time of the ABS-CBN Rufa and I show. And it was actually spaghetti, eggplant spaghetti. Oh, it looks like real meat, but it's, it is made up of talong. <laughs> Ibig sabihin, hindi, hindi malalaman ng mga anak nyo na talong yung spaghetti nyo. And it's really nice. No? Kids would really love eating the spaghetti talong. And what's this one? What's this? <laughs> that is kamansi in Tagalog. And you usually do that as your vegetable dish, right? Oh, I really love that one. You can create lots and lots of recipes from that. What's that one? Kamansi, oh, that's this one. Ube? Ube? Eh, what's this? Kamote? <laughs> okay, when it comes to kamote, I love kamote. And look, it's by the 3,000. Uh, beta carotene and calcium is good, huh? And you can have lots and lots of recipes. Okay, anong pwede niyong gawin sa takal talbos ng kamote? Huh? Salad. What else? Okay, you can have sinigang, lauoy. You can even turn it into ginatan. You can even turn it into tempura. No, the one that we popularized in Rufa and I is actually the talbos ng kamote juice. You boil the talbos ng kamote and then you put calamansi and it becomes purple. It becomes pushya. And it's really nice, no? People won't really recognize that it is talbos ng kamote juice. And it's really, really good. Better than soft drinks, better than any other synthetic juices. What's that one? Kalab oh, what can you do to kalabasa flower? Huh? Do you cook kalabasa flower here? Oh, what cookery? Dining, ding, you're Ilocano, huh? huh? Wow, Ilocano from the Visayan region. <laughs> the dining, ding, actually, the Ilocanos and the Visayans have good recipes when it comes to indigenous vegetables. And it's really nice. Look, it's really high in beta carotene and calcium. Okay, what's this? What's this? Pako, fern. Okay, so fern is really good. And you, if you want to really see the nutritional value, this is the nutritional value. It's really high. Now, anong recipe ang magagawa nyo sa pako? Salad, what else? When you do salad, do you still boil it or just raw? Okay, you can do both. 
Okay, you can do both. The upper portion, you can make it raw. Just wash carefully. And then you can serve it raw. We usually cook the lower portion. So you can have two recipes. You can have lots and lots of pako recipes. You can have a hundred variations when it comes to, the, 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 um, to this kind of vegetable. That's the one. You can cut the upper portion and then make it salad. Don't cook anymore. And then the lower portion maybe because it's a little bit hard. You can, you can blanch. Okay? Now, my, our favorite is pako with whole kernel corn. Oh, you want to taste that one? You have to stir fry. You can stir fry with garlic and onions in oil and water in water instead of oil. And then put kernel corn and then put the pako and then so cook it just uh, half done. And then season a little and that's it. Wow, that's really delicious. What's that one? Oh, sino makakahula sa inyo niyan? Huh? Huh? What's that? Kamatis. Okay, tomatoes. Okay. It's really nice. Especially when uh, it is season. Oh, it's really nice to eat tomatoes. And you can have good beta-carotene and good calcium. Oh. Do you have this kind of vegetable here? Saluyo. This is for the Ilocano, right? <laughs> Saluyo is really nice. And look at the nutritional value of Saluyo. Close to 6,000. It's really high. And calcium is close to 400. What's this? Okay, somebody who can guess it right, I have a prize for you. It is actually a lagikway. Okay. Huh? Huh? It starts with letter T. Uh, in Tagalog, no, uh, it starts with letter T, and the next letter is A. Yata. It's T A L. I. N. I don't know if it is familiar here. I I'm saying the Tagalog word, but it is actually talinum. That one. When you cook this one to your sinigang, you don't need sour, you know? <laughs> you can find it anywhere around, right? <laughs> and it's really nice. Look at the nutritional value. Okay, here. That is talinum. In English, we call it, there are lots of spin, Philippine spinach. Uh, kulit is also is Philippine spinach, but there, we have lots and lots. Okay? Pag wala na tayong pangalan, wala silang ma-translate. If they cannot translate it in English anymore, all vegetables are called spinach. <laughs> so easy, ha, Pastor Lowell? If they don't have, cannot English it anymore, everything is spinach. <laughs> okay, so this is talinom, and it is very popular in the north. Okay? What's that one? Starts with letter S. Huh? Sita? <laughs> Malapit na. Okay. Huh? Singkamas? Lumayo. <laughs> okay, that is actually sigadilias. And sigadilias, wow! You have both the seeds and the vegetable, and it's really wow! When you turn this adobo, ay, super wow! Ano, ma'am? <laughs> Okay, all we have to do is really look for our native dishes. How about this one? Huh? What's this one? Starts with B. Uh, this is actually batao. Okay. Hyacinth bean. And when, no, you can actually cook this in many ways. Now, I have one question for you guys. What is this? This is our last vegetable for tonight. What's this? It looks like okra, but it is not okra. It starts with letter L. By the way, this is indig indigenous vegetable. According to the Bureau of Plant Industry, you cannot find this anymore, and nobody's really promoting this vegetable. But tonight, we would like to shout to the world that we have to propagate this plant. If you want to know, what's this? Lagikwai. Okay, so this is lagikwai. And if you want to look at the nutritional value, wow. 
It's really wow. <laughs> now, I have bought Lagikway here from Manila. <laughs> Actually, from Cavite. And we just asked, Pastor Chris asked somebody to boil this one. And it looks like this. This one is evergreen. So even though you cook in the morning and waited for the evening, it's still evergreen. It doesn't change color. So I suspect the chloro chlorophyll is very high. Now those of you who are really talbos ng kamote and okra lovers, you will really enjoy this one. I love lagikway. Okay? All you have to do is just blanch. You can cook any dish, any, any cookery here. But the best actually is, one of the best is you can boil and then you can put little soy sauce and little calamansi and maybe you can, you can put tomatoes and little onions and other vegetables, a salad. This is really good. Okay? Um, this lagikway is so easy to propagate. All you have to do is plant this stalk. I have, already gave, I have already distributed to some of my friends here. And you are now in charge, huh? <laughs> in charge to propagate. This is so easy to plant. All you have to do is put this one. It plant like talbus ng kamote. And then when you harvest, you harvest at the tip. You get the tip so that it will branch. Later on, you'll see there are lots and lots of branch and it can go higher than your roof. So this is good, especially during rainy season. Uh, during summer, sometimes uh, namamatay siya. Umuunti ng dahon. But during rainy season, you can see lots and lots of leaves. Now, this vegetable is already in the food composition table. I was so amazed. Imagine for so long a time, this... This is actually, this was actually one of the Filipino, Filipino vegetables. But right now, you can hardly see people promoting this vegetable. So I still have, I still have, oh, this is for you, Maminda. <laughs> Talagang sumesenyas na siya. This is for my friend, Maminda. You are in charge, ha? So the daughters of Mary Immaculate will propagate this one. Okay. And it's so easy. Okay. Actually, you can double that one and you can, you can have two. Uh, two plants from that stock. Okay? So, we want you, I am inviting you to join us. Plant Lagikway. Because when you want to see the nutritional value, I personally believe this is second to Malungay. Okay? So, let's all join. You know, those of you who have green thumbs, you can, you can come to me later on and I'll give you some stock here for Propagation. But you will really be... You like one, ma'am? Alika na nga. <laughs> Pag ganyan ang mga ngiti, hindi ko tinatanggihan yun eh. Oh! So you want... This is now a challenge. If you can propagate, this is for you. Oh, see, we have a, a friend here. It's a challenge, ha? Huh? Imagine a white guy here who will be planting lagikway. Oh, sorry. Next time, I'll bring another one. Huh? Okay, so we, we trust that you can propagate that one. So we welcome you to join our ministry, and we call it, we can help other people plant indigenous vegetables. Because indigenous vegetables can actually give us lots and lots of nutritional value. Now, those of you who are familiar in creation, do you know the original diet God has given to Adam and Eve? What's the, what was the original diet? Fruits, very good. Grains and nuts. Fruits, grains, and nuts. And where is the vegetable? You know, the vegetable was just added after the fall. God was so kind to Adam and Eve because it was already... No, not so perfect environment anymore. Maybe the food is, was not that perfect anymore after the fall. But you know what? God gave the herbs. And I was really trying to look what is really in the herbs. You know what? The herbs, the herbs that we have right now, as I have shown you, 
If it is the fruit and compared to the herbs, to the leaves, the leaves contain good amount of vitamins and minerals. If you want to see the ORAC units, the ORAC units, we call it, it's an acronym, Oxidative Radical Absorbance Capacity. It is the capacity of food to protect you from diseases. It is the capacity of food to give you good nourishment, supply you with your antioxidants to fight the free radicals. You know what? The fruit so easy. According to the study, you have to eat at least no, 3,500 ORAC units per day if you just want to maintain, to maintain health. But if you want to reverse or to prevent aging, gusto natin yan, ano? <laughs> to prevent aging, you have to increase to 5,000 to 6,000 ORAC units. Now, maybe some of you are a little bit confused right now and worried. What's ORAC units? You know what? If you go vegetable, okay, this is it. If you go leafy vegetables, talbus ng malunggay, kamote, alugbate, and you have one cup of vegetable, of talbus ng malunggay or any vegetable, saluyot or alugbate or kulitis or spinach, you can have 2,000 plus ORAC units for one cup. Ah. So if you are poor and you don't have money to buy, to, to, to spend for the, the fruits, the fruits also contain good amount of ORAC units. But for those people who are poor, so easy. All you have to do is eat two cups of vegetables, greens, per day, and you'll have already 4,500 ORAC units. Your cup of mongo has another 1,000 ORAC units. So you have two cups of vegetables, one cup of mongo, that's already 5,000 ORAC units. And if you have a piece of watermelon as big as this, that's another 1,000 ORAC units. And plus, you have, for example, four pieces of, mm, what's this, tomatoes. Oh, that's already 7,000 ORAC units. You, so you, even, you can even go beyond the recommendation. So friends, it's so easy, so easy to achieve the ORAC units, so easy to achieve the nutritional value per day recommended to us if we always include greens in our diet. If you have all these native vegetables, if you have all these locally grown vegetables that we have, we could actually complete the recommended nutritional value. Before I stop, I'd like to invite you, maybe tomorrow or tonight or some of you or we are interested to go our testing. We have already the microcirculation test, but we can only, we have already started earlier. Early birds can have, ano, huh? good feeds. <laughs> so those people who came here early had already good experience in the microcirculation test. The microcirculation test is the capillary test. We want to challenge you. This is not a diagnostic machine. This is a challenge machine. Because once you see your capillary and it's not moving, and I see a guy here, the capillary is so fast, huh? Because you have good exercise. Wow, it's so long and it's so good and you can see flow of blood. And because he has exercise, okay? regular exercise this machine can actually challenge you all you have to do is how should we do this maybe we can just register and then we will um, accommodate you on that corner tomorrow you come early so that we can have the screening early okay on and even on sunday yeah we can have good time if you can come early here maybe we can have some orientations and some challenge and then the challenge is this those of you who cannot see good flow, poor circulations, don't worry. Don't be sad. This is the right time to start a healthy living. And just for two weeks of very good lifestyle, you have to eat your vegetable, you have to go exercise, hydrate, drink good amount of water, sleep early before 10 p.m., and then exercise. And be very patient, very good to, your, to the people around you. Promise. Just in two weeks, you can have good circulations. Okay, so thank you very much for giving me your time. And I'm challenging all of us. Let's start it good today.
Smells green. <laughs> Welcome tonight, and thank you, Dr. Blessy, for that good instruction. I hope you eat your greens if you want to slow the aging process. Now, if you want to speed up the, the aging process, then you reach for a cup of coffee. That's if you want to speed up the aging process and get older quicker. Cup of coffee. We learned about that yesterday or the other day. We welcome you to Revelations of Prophecy tonight. Or if you're watching in the Western Hemisphere, it'll be good morning. But we welcome all those that are watching and those of you that are here. A thank you for those of you who've given offerings for our seminar expenses. We appreciate that. We're going to start with our quiz tonight, so if you'll take out your quiz envelope, you should have got something like this handed to you or in your Bible, and inside of that is a quiz card. This is a quiz from Wednesday. Our topic Wednesday was Revelations Millennium, when the devil goes on vacation. Question number one. According to the scriptures, there are two resurrections separated by a thousand-year period. Which of these resurrections takes place at the beginning, and which takes place at the end of the thousand-year period? You say, Pastor, this is really big. This is a big quiz tonight. Look how big it is. Fills up one question fills up the whole screen. Well, I hope you can remember. You can put down... B for beginning, and then write down. There's a resurrection at the beginning and a resurrection at the end. So put B and then which resurrection? E for the end and put down which resurrection? According to the scriptures, there are two resurrections separated by a thousand-year period. Which of these resurrections takes place at the beginning and which takes place at the end of the thousand years? Ready for number two? I see your writing. And by the way, if you took notes, this is an open book quiz. 
open note quiz. If you're watching, you can also do the quiz on a blank piece of paper. Question number two, true or false? The bottomless pit refers to the earth in its broken down, desolate condition after Christ's second coming. True or false, the bottomless pit refers to the earth in its broken down, desolate condition after Christ's second coming. Question number three is the question, does hell burn before or after the thousand years? Does hell... Shh, write down the answer. We'll get a chance to review and check ourselves. Does hell burn before or after the thousand years? Question number four is a multiple choice. Where will the righteous be during the thousand years? A, on earth. B, in heaven. C, no one knows. So write down A, B, or C. Where will the righteous be during the thousand years? A, on the earth. B, in heaven. C, no one knows. Final question now, number five. Where will the wicked be during the thousand years? Alive on the earth? In heaven with the saints? Dead on the earth, either lying on the ground or in their grave. So again, A, B, or C. Multiple choice for the last question. A, alive on the earth. Where will the wicked be during the thousand years? A, alive on the earth. B, in heaven with the saints. C, dead on the earth, either lying on the ground or in their graves. Now let's put up all the questions together and we'll review and see how well we did. Question number one, according to scriptures, there are two resurrections separated by a thousand year period. Which of these resurrections takes place at the beginning and which takes place at the end? All right, the beginning, which is that? Resurrection, resurrection of life, or if you just put life. At the end, damnation. Resurrection of life at the beginning, resurrection of damnation at the end. I hope you got that one. Number two, true or false, the bottomless pit refers to the earth in its broken down, desolate condition after Christ's second coming. What's the answer? That is true. Question three, does hell burn before or after the thousand years? It burns after the thousand years. Question number four, where will the righteous be during the thousand years? A, B, or C? B, in heaven. And the final question, where will the wicked be during the thousand years? What's the answer? C, dead on the earth, either lying in the, on the ground or in their graves. How many got 100% on the quiz? Oh, it didn't look like too many of you did. Maybe you forgot, didn't take notes. Take notes this time, tonight, and then next quiz, you'll be able to open your notes and do better on the quiz. We're going to sing this song as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card with your questions, your, your score, your prayer requests. While they collect the quiz, we're going to sing, Rejoice, you pure in heart. Rejoice, ye pure in heart. Rejoice, give thanks and sing. Your festival but a wave of heart. The cross of Christ your Oh 
sound wonderful out there. It's like we have a big choir. And I hope those of you that are watching in some other venue can sing along with us and we sing each evening. This will be your lesson tonight. You'll actually get more than one lesson. We're going to give you tonight two lessons and one handout. You'll get the lesson, question, number 15, Who is the Antichrist? You'll also get this lesson, number 21, the U United States in Bible Prophecy. This is an extra lesson that we're giving you. And then we're going to give you a handout that deals with 666. So you'll be walking out of here this evening with a lot of handouts. And we do encourage you to do the lessons. I know a number of you are doing the lessons. The back of each lesson, there's a summary sheet. You fill it out. Drop it off at the table, the registration table. We'll check that lesson, and then we return it to you. Usually the next day, you can pick it up. If you get all the lessons done, you'll get a diploma at the end of our seminar. This is the Bible you get to keep after you come to 15 lectures. So when you've been here 15 times, just stop at our registration table and verify I've been here faithfully. Tomorrow morning, we will be meeting at 10 o'clock right here. Our topic will be Revelation's Gateway to a New Life. How to start a new life. That'll be at 10 o'clock right here. Then tomorrow night at our normal time. What's our normal time? 6 o'clock. Don't come 7. You'll be late. In fact, come early. If you come before 6 o'clock, then you can have your finger tested with the microcirculation unit and see how well your uh, circulation is doing. And they generally start music here before 6, so you get to enjoy the music if you come before 6. But our topic, Sabbath night, will be the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Probably the most significant topic in our entire seminar. Then on Sunday, survival keys for Revelation's end time. How to survive Revelation's end time. We'll look at that on Sunday. Those of you that are here tonight, if you are with us in the morning and in the evening, tomorrow evening, and on Sunday, then we will be giving you for free the final events of Bible Prophecy DVD. We'll give them out on Tuesday. So verify that you're here. Make sure you drop off your ticket. And then also tomorrow and on Sunday and then on Tuesday, you can pick up your free DVD. Now, if you miss a meeting, well, you get, you'll have to buy the DVD. But if you want it for free, be here. You're here now, so just come tomorrow, tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, and then Sunday. Let's now stand and sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. You're watching in some other venue, stand with us and sing with us. Turn your Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing each of us here to this place this evening to study the Bible. Those that are in other places, we thank you you've gathered us. Those that are watching, we're thankful you've guided us to this program. We pray that you would teach us the truth regarding the Antichrist and 666. I pray for special grace and wisdom to share this topic clearly and kindly. Bless us, we pray, each of us, in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for tonight, Revelation exposes the Antichrist and 666. Tonight, we're going to begin with a warning. What you are about to hear tonight may be very disturbing. Tonight we're going to identify the Antichrist beast of Revelation 13. And for some of you, this topic is going to be absolutely shocking. 
For some of you, this topic may be very disturbing. For some of you, this topic is going to be the most amazing prophetic study you've ever heard in your entire life. And for some of you, this topic is only going to confirm what you had already known or suspected. But whatever the case may be, I want to assure you tonight that what you're going to hear is the truth. And I have been in prayer today that God have helped me to share it in the most tactful and clear manner. Jesus assures us we can know the truth. Let's read that again together. John 8, verse 32. Read with me. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. However, sometimes the truth hurts. But God doesn't send the truth to hurt us, but to enlighten and to save us. That's why he warns us about the Antichrist beast. Let's go read that warning again found in Revelation 13. If you have your Bible, turn to the last book, Revelation 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. We'll begin this evening with a bit of review. This is part 2 tonight of the Antichrist. So we're going to start with a bit of review from part 1, what we've learned. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, Revelation 13, have you found that yet? Yes? If you're there, say amen. amen. All right, verses, verse 1. John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a, a what? A leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seed and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, remember he had seven, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And how much of the world? All the world wondered after the beast. Who is this beast? Verse 3, all Bible scholars of all churches agree that this beast is a symbol of the Antichrist. However, we've already learned that a beast in Bible prophecy represents what? Beast represents a kingdom or a nation. We saw that from Daniel 7, verse 23, where the angel told Daniel the fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. So we know that the, a beast in prophecy has to represent some kingdom. The Antichrist beast then in Revelation 13 has to be some kingdom. Let's review the four beasts from Daniel 7 just by <clears throat> way of review. The lion beast with eagle's wings was what kingdom? That was Babylon, symbolized Babylon. How about the bear raised up on one side with three ribs in his mouth? Symbol of Medo-Persia. What about the leopard beast that had four heads and four wings? Symbol of Greece. What about the dragon-like beast that had ten horns? A symbol of Rome. We learned that that fourth beast, Rome, had ten horns. What did the ten horns represent? The ten kingdoms that came out of the fourth empire, the ten divisions of the ancient Roman Empire. Here we have a map of those ten divisions. Seven of those original ten kingdoms are still in existence today in modern Europe. Here we have them listed. Three have become extinct. They are the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And we have learned what happened to them. They were uprooted by another little horn. Let's go back and read that from Daniel now. Daniel 7. We'll read verse 8. We have the page on the screen if you're using the King James Version Philippine Bible Society Bible, which is what we're using here. Daniel 7, verse 8. This is the little horn pictured. Daniel 7, verse 8. Daniel says, I considered the horn. So what's he looking at? He's looking at the horns, yes, but the horns represented. The ten horns were the ten divisions of the ancient Roman Empire, or in other words, Western Europe. So Daniel is looking at Western Europe. He's looking at the ten horns. That's where the ten were. And he says he saw another little horn coming up among them, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. So they were uprooted. And behold, in this horn, this little horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. We talked about the little horn when we studied about the Antichrist part one. 
And we learned that the Antichrist beast of Revelation 13 is the same as the little horn. We saw that already. Both symbolize the Antichrist. Daniel wanted to know who this little horn was, this mystery of the little horn. In fact, let's read Daniel 7, verses 19 and 20. Daniel 7, there it is, verses 19 and 20. Daniel says, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Of course, we now know who that fourth beast was. That was Rome. And then verse 20, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other, that's a little one, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So Daniel says, I want to know about all this. But especially about that little horn. I want to know who that little horn is. Would you like to know who the little horn is? Little horn symbolizes the Antichrist. Some people have the idea, what I don't know won't hurt me. Have you ever heard that saying? What I don't know won't hurt me. Is that true? Well, for example, suppose that my arteries are getting all clogged up with cholesterol and I don't know it. Can it hurt me? Oh, yes, it could kill me. And suppose I go to the doctor for an examination, and he tells me, Lowell, you have elevated cholesterol levels. You better change your lifestyle, or you may have a heart attack or a stroke. Is that good news? Mm. Bad news. So what should I do? I should get mad at the doctor for giving me such bad news, right? No, I ought to be thankful that the doctor was willing to tell me the truth, even though the truth is not good news, even though it's sort of painful. So if you find the truth tonight a bit painful, don't get mad at me, see. I'm just like the doctor, sharing with you the information. Or maybe I should pause and ask you, do you really want the information? You want, the, you want me to, how many of you want me to continue this presentation? Are you sure? Well, I was planning to continue anyway. <laughs> but now I know you want me to. Now I know you're not going to get up and go storming out of here because you discovered something that maybe you had never known before. Daniel, he didn't know who this little horn was, but he wanted to know. And God, of course, doesn't name the little horn for us, but he gives us a whole host of clues. And when we were studying part one of the Antichrist, we looked at the clues concerning this little horn. So this is going to be a bit of a review. You should have had this in your notes, or you received the handout with these ten clues. Let's go back through them again. The little horn comes up among the ten. We got that from Daniel 7, verse 8. Or where in the world? Where were the ten? Over in Western Europe. So we know the little horn, which is a symbol of the Antichrist, must come up somewhere over in Western Europe. That was our first clue. And then secondly, the little horn would come up after the 10, Daniel 7, 24, or after what date? 476. Because the fourth beast, Rome, didn't fall until 476. The 10 horns didn't come up until 476. So the little horn coming up after them would have to come up after 476. It would be a little horn or a little kingdom. We got that from Daniel 7, verse 8. It would uproot three. Daniel 7, verse 8 told us. And we know from history those three, they were the Harali, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. That's why they don't exist today. They were uprooted by the little horn. Number five would have a human leader because the Bible said this little horn had eyes like the eyes of a man. So it would have a visible human leader. Daniel 7, verse 8. Number 6, it would be different or diverse from all the other horns or kingdoms. Daniel 7, verse 24 told us. Number 7, would blaspheme God. Daniel 7, verse 25. And you may remember we got some definitions about blasphemy. John 10, 33. Blasphemy is when a man makes himself God on earth. In fact, we saw that. John 10, verses 30 to 33. That's one definition of blasphemy in the Bible. There's actually several. And I'd like to share with you another, a second definition, biblical definition, for blasphemy. So if you're in Daniel, you might want to leave a marker there. We may come back. But let's go to Luke for a second definition of blasphemy this evening. Luke 5, 
verses 20 and 21. This is New Testament. Luke 5, 20 and 21. This is the story of how they brought to Jesus this man that was paralyzed, and there was such a crowd they couldn't get in, and so they went up on the roof, and they opened up the roof and let this man down in the presence of Jesus. Notice what Jesus says. Luke 5, verse 19. Luke 5, verse... Oh, I said 19. It should be 20. Here it is. 20 and 21. We got it on the screen, so you can keep up that way. Verse 20 says, When he, Jesus, saw their faith, he said unto the man, unto, the, unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Wouldn't you like to hear those words from Jesus? Man or lady, your sins are forgiven you. Would you like to hear those words? Well, by faith you can. When you confess your sins to Jesus, then these words are for you. He says to you, man or lady, your sins are forgiven. Well, somebody didn't like that. Verse 21 says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? So a second Bible definition of blasphemy is when a man claims the power to forgive sin. Of course, for Jesus, that was not blasphemy. He does have the power. He is God. He, he has the power to forgive sins. But for any man to claim that, that would be blasphemy. So this little horn claims to have the power to forgive sin, claims to be God on earth. You may remember Paul said that the Man of sin would sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, exalting himself above God. So, blasphemy is when a man makes himself God on earth or claims the power to forgive sin. Let's now go to number eight. The little horn would persecute the saints. We got that from Daniel 7, 21 and 25. And then number nine, the little horn would change God's law. We got that from Daniel 7, 25 also. And then number 10, our final one, the little horn would rule for 1,260 years. We got that from Daniel 7, verse 25, where it says the little horn would rule for a, a time, times, and the dividing of time. We went to Revelation 12, verse 14, and Revelation 12, verse 6, and we learned that a time times, and the dividing of time is the same as 1,260 days. This is all review, so if you feel like I, I don't remember all this, get out your notes. We, and if you missed that, you can ask for the handout on that, the earlier handout. But let's review the 1,260 days, time, times, half a time, time, singular would be one year, times, plural, two years, Half time, dividing of time, half year. So what do you have? You have three and one half years. Three and one half years using the Bible formula of 30 days of the month will give you exactly 1,260 days. But we're studying prophecy. And in prophecy, a day represents? A day represents a year. We got that from Ezekiel 4.6. God says, I've appointed you each day for a year. Numbers 14.34, each day for a year. Genesis 29, 27, day for a year. So in prophecy, that's just the prophetic parts of the Bible. Any other time a day is 24 hours, generally. But when you're studying prophecy, God says in prophecy a day represents a year. We have three and a half prophetic years, 1,260 prophetic days, or 1,260 literal years that this little horn, symbol of the Antichrist, would rule. So there we have Ten clues. All of that was review. Now we're moving on to Antichrist part two tonight. And I'm going to give you an 11th clue. And this is the clincher. With this 11th clue, you will be able to tell me who the Antichrist is. But before I share with you the 11th clue, I want to make two other points. My first point will come from the Bible. And our text for this point is second, or first, first Timothy, rather. First Timothy 2, verses 4 and 5. First Timothy 2, verses 4 and 5, who, which says, Who will have all men to be saved? This is referring to God. God wants all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. What truth does God want us all to know? The next verse tells us, verse 5, For there is how many? One God. And one mediator between God and men, and that mediator is who? 
the man, Christ Jesus. The Antichrist system that we're going to identify tonight puts many mediators between God and man. We'll see that. But the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, and that mediator is who? The man, Jesus Christ. The second point I want to make before we go any farther tonight, truth is not against sincere people. Truth is against error. No doubt in an audience of this size, or some of you who may be watching, there may be people here who are affiliated with the system we're about to identify. Or maybe you have family or friends that are affiliated with the system we're about to identify. And I want to make it very clear, we are identifying a kingdom, not sincere people that might be connected to that kingdom. Let me illustrate this way. Some years ago, my family and I, we were in the country of Ukraine. We spent almost six years there in Ukraine. And we found the Ukrainian people to be some of the most warm, friendly, hospitable people of any people group that we've met. They're almost as friendly as the Filipinos. Almost, <laughs> I said. <laughs> I think the Filipinos are the most friendly people on the face of the globe. But anyway, the Ukrainians are almost as friendly as you are. However, the Ukrainian government is the most backward, disorganized, corrupt government of any government I've ever seen. And most Ukrainians would agree with that. So you can see there's a big difference between the people and the kingdom. Can you see that difference? Let me illustrate another way. During World War II, Hitler led the German people in a war against the world, essentially. If you had been a German living back then, would that mean because you were German, you were a bad person? No. My wife's parents immigrated from Germany. So my wife, she was born in America. She's full-blooded German. Sweetest German in the world. My wife. <laughs> But you can see there's a difference between the people and the kingdom. Can you see that difference? How many of you can see the difference between people and the kingdom? Let me see your hands. I want to make that very clear tonight. We are going to identify a kingdom. Not sincere people that might be connected to the kingdom. And don't forget that. So those are the two points I wanted to make before we move on. Now let's go to our 11th clue. This is the clincher. We have already learned that the beast and the little horn are the same thing. They both symbolize the Antichrist. So we're going to get our 11th clue from Revelation. Revelation 13, 2. You can put this in your notes if you'd like. The Bible says the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. In Daniel 7, the dragon beast symbolized what kingdom? Rome. And so here, Revelation says the dragon, Rome, gave him, that's the Antichrist beast, his power and his seat and great authority. Every kingdom, every government has a seat. For example, the seat of the Philippine government is where? Manila. The seat of the Indonesian government is where? Jakarta. The seat of the American government is where? Washington, D.C., where was the seat of the ancient Roman Empire? The seat of Rome was the city of Rome, right? The kingdom of Rome had its seat there in the city of Rome. And so the Bible tells us, Revelation 13, 2, the dragon Rome gave him, the Antichrist beast, his power and his seat, our capital city, and great authority. So that gives us our 11th clue, which we're going to add to our list. This would have to be a kingdom then that is based in the city of Rome. When you put number three, a little kingdom, together with number 11, based in Rome, it begins to become obvious who God is identifying. I presented this topic, by the way, in many countries of the world. And when I get to point number 11, little, little kingdom based in Rome, I see people start nodding their heads. I say, yeah, I know who that is. Who can tell me what little kingdom today, based in Rome, meets all these points? Vatican Kingdom. Now, let's stop right here. This is not an attack on Catholics. We are identifying a kingdom. You still see the difference, right, between people and in the kingdom? 
There have been and still are today many wonderful Catholic people. I think of Mother Teresa and all the good that she has done and did. And many of them have been saints all down through time in the kingdom. I personally believe that there will be many Roman Catholics in heaven. I actually believe there will be many people in heaven from every church. I think there will be people in the other place, the hot place, also from every church. Don't you suppose? So we're not identifying people. This is not an attack on Catholic people. We're identifying a kingdom here. And it's amazing to me there are many Roman Catholics that don't necessarily go along with all the dogmas and the requirements of the kingdom. They follow the Bible. They teach, they, they believe in Jesus Christ. They seek to follow Him. They confess their sins directly to Him. So if you are a Catholic, this is not against you. It's actually for you. But let's answer the question, is the Vatican a kingdom? Yes, more than a, it's not just a church, it is a kingdom. Did you know that 174 nations have diplomatic relations with the Vatican? Including America, we have an ambassador to the Vatican. And so do, I understand, so does the Philippines. We have an ambassador to the Vatican because it's a kingdom. Let's go back through our list and see if all 11 points fit the Vatican. This is a review. Number one, among the ten, does that fit Vatican? Yes, Vatican is over there in Western Europe, in Italy, in the heart of Rome. So number one fits. It would be among the ten. That's where the ten were located. Let's go now to number two, after 476. It was the year 538 when the Vatican was made powerful, when it became a sort of a leader. Let me give you some evidence for this. This is from the book Catholic Church, page 14, by E.G. McKenzie. And by the way, we're going to try to give you many of these quotations in your handout tonight. It says, A.D. 538 was the year when the Ostrogoths collapsed. It was out of the smoking ruins of the Western Roman Empire, and after the overthrow of the three Aryan kingdoms, what were those three Aryan kingdoms? Those were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. So it says, after the overthrow of the three Aryan kingdoms, that the Pope of Rome emerged as the most important single individual in the West. The head of a closely organized church with a carefully defined creed and with vast potential for what? Political influence. Dozens of writers have pointed out that the real survivor of the ancient Roman Empire was the Church of Rome. End of quote. All right, here's another statement. This is from the book, The History of the Christian Church, volume 3, page 327, which says the papacy's power became supreme in Christendom in what year? 538 A.D., due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian, known as Justinian's Decree, which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all churches. It gave the papacy political power, civil power, as well as ecclesiastical power. What year? 538. This letter became part of Justinian's Code, the fundamental law of the empire, and the year Pope Vigilus ascended the throne under the military protection of Belisarus. So, number, four, number two fits after 476. It was the year 538 A.D. Let's go now to number three, a little horn or a little kingdom. Does that fit Vatican? Yes. Did you know that Vatican only occupies 44 hectares? And yet the Vatican is the most wealthy nation on the face of the globe. Vatican owns more gold, more real estate globally than any other entity or kingdom. It's the... It, probably the most influential kingdom on the face of the globe, Vatican, but it's very small. In fact, the encyclopedia says this about Vatican. I thought this was amazing. Vatican City, an independent state, so it's an independent nation, under the absolute authority of the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church, it is an enclave with, within Rome, Italy, with an area of 44 hectares. That's about 109 acres. The smallest independent country in the world. Vatican City was established in 1929 under the terms of the Lateran Treaty. Notice it's the smallest country in the world. The Bible said it would be a little horn. 
You say, well, it says 1929. Wasn't it 538? Yes, it was 538 originally. 1260 years later, it was abolished. And then in 1929, it was reestablished as an empire. We'll see that later tonight. So number three, a little kingdom. That fits also the Vatican. Let's go to number four, uproots three. Those three we know were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. We just read about them earlier. They were the three Aryan kingdoms. They were overthrown because they refused to submit to the authority of the Bishop of Rome. So they were eradicated completely. Number five, it would have a human leader. Who is that? That's the Pope. So, of course, number five also fits. Let's go now to number six. It would be diverse or different from all the other kingdoms or governments in Europe. What does history tell us? Quote, you'll get this in your handout. Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states whose central point was the papal see. In other words, the Vatican. There, therefore, inevitably resulted a position not only new, but very what? Different from the former. The Bible said this would be a different or a diverse horn or kingdom. And even history says it's diverse or different. That's from the book, The Church and Churches, page 42 and 43. Vatican is the only kingdom in Europe today where a church dictates the policies of the state. Very different from all the others. Let's go now to our next one. Number seven, blasphemy. Blasphemy, we learned, is when a man makes himself God on earth. John 10, verse 30, 33. And blasphemy is when a man claims the power to forgive sin. Luke 5, verse 21. Here is a statement from Pope Leo XIII, who said, quote, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. End of quote. Here's another statement. This is from the book, Eucharistic Meditations, referring to the Pope. It says, Thou art a priest forever, says the ordaining bishop. He is no longer a man, a sinful child of Adam, but an altar Christos, another Christ, forever a priest of the Most High, with power over the Almighty. End of quote. So he actually claims to have power over God. But notice he is called an altar Christos, another Christ. Do you know what the word antichrist in the Bible actually means? Anti, if you look it up in the original Greek, it actually means somebody who puts himself in place of. Not somebody that's against, but somebody that's in place of. In place of Christ. Here's a statement from the Catholic National Magazine, July 1895 which says, quote, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh, end of quote. The Bible calls that blasphemy. Here's another one. I'm just showing you how this all fits. So I'm giving these quotations. This is from the New York Catechism, taken from Roman Catholicism, page 127, quote, he, that's the Pope, is the infallible ruler, the supreme judge of heaven and earth, the judge of all, being judged by no one, God himself on earth, end of quote. The Bible calls that blasphemy. Blasphemy is also when a man claims the power to forgive sin. I thought this was an interesting picture. Here you see the automatic confession machine. I guess you can go now to the internet, you can type in your sin, and it will tell you how many Hail Marys or, or whatever it is you have to do to be absolved. You still have to go and confess to a priest at least once a year. But now you can get sort of a head start on that. <laughs> Here's a statement from the book, The Catholic P Priest, page 78, which says, quote, Seek where you will through heaven and earth, and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest, end of quote. Question, do we need a priest to approach God? Yes, we do. Do we have a priest to approach God? Yes, we do. His name is? Jesus Christ. 
The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. And who is the mediator? The man Christ Jesus. You can go to Jesus and confess your sins. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, to Jesus that is, he, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't need a pope, you don't need a priest, you don't need an earthly priest that is. Or a saint, you can go directly to Jesus Christ. And I might mention there are many Catholics that are doing this. They're confessing their sins directly to Jesus. I've had many Catholics tell me, I don't like to go to confessional and confess to a priest. Especially after what some of these priests are doing. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are some godly priests. And they will tell you that what you're hearing tonight is the truth. But there are many others that are having problems, you know, either with alcohol or with boys or whatever, and you, so you kind of feel bad about confessing to somebody like that. But you can confess to Jesus, and there are many Catholics that are doing that. I know the Pope doesn't like it, but there are many that are confessing directly to Jesus. Now, I want to clarify something else. We can forgive one another. Jesus teaches that in Matthew 6, 12 through 15. When someone sins against you, you are to forgive them. Now, of course, ultimately, only God can forgive sin. But when somebody sins against you, then the person that has wronged you should come to you, or if you've wronged someone, you should go to the person you've wronged and ask them to forgive you. Not only do we confess to God our sin, but if we've wronged somebody, hurt somebody, we ought to confess to them also. Jesus teaches that. So we can forgive one another of the sins we've done to one another. If you hurt somebody... Go to that person, not to the priest, unless you hurt him. Go to the person you've wronged and ask them to forgive you. Of course, you must confess to Jesus also to be ultimately forgiven. Let's go now to, we looked at number seven, blasphemy, that fits. Let's go now to number eight, persecuting. Here is what the British historian William Edward Lecky wrote. He said, quote, that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history, end of quote. That's from the book, The History of the Rise of the Spirit of Rationalism in Europe, volume 2, page 32. The Church of Rome itself estimates it put 50 million people to death during the Dark Ages. That's their own estimate. In fact, it was in the year 2000 when Pope John Paul II apologized to the world for what happened during the Dark Ages. So this is simply history. I'm showing you how that this fits with prophecy. So number eight also fits persecuting. Let's go to number nine. Change God's law. Here is an amazing decretal from the Vatican, which says, quote, The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate, that means to abolish laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ, end of quote. So he claims the power even to change the precepts of Christ. Here is a photograph of the catechism. This is the converts catechism. And if you have a catechism, you can check this out yourself. You'll find this in most all of the catechisms. We have here the Ten Commandments. And you notice that it says for the second commandment, what is the second commandment? I can't hardly read. Thou shalt have no... Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Is that the second commandment? No. Here's the second commandment from the Bible. You can check this out yourself. Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. God says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. That's the second commandment. You won't find that commandment in the catechism. And you know why, probably. It's been taken out of the catechism, the commandment about bowing before graven images. By the way, it's also missing out of the Lutheran catechism. For you Lutherans, you don't find it in your catechism either. You check it out in the catechism. Well, of course, that leaves nine commandments. So what they do? 
they divided the Tenth Commandment into two, to have Ten Commandments. You can check it out also in the Catechism. Here is another commandment that was changed. This is right out of the Catechism. Question, which is the Sabbath day? Here's the answer from the Catechism. Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Here's the answer from the Catechism. Because the Catholic Church transferred solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. End of quote. Change God's law, just like the prophecy said would happen. Here is a statement from a Catholic priest who said, quote, Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church, Church of Rome, ever did happen in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed. Note that. The Bible said it would change God's law. So this priest says the holy day of the Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the Scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the Scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy, end of quote. This is from the St. Catherine Catholic Church, Sentinel Magazine, May 21, 1995. So this Catholic priest says, look, if you want to make the Bible your sole authority, then go join those Adventists and keep Saturday, the Sabbath holy. So yes, God's law was changed. The second commandment was re removed. You can see this in your own catechism. The fourth commandment was changed, and the tenth commandment was divided. Changed God's law. So number nine fits. Let's go to number ten. Would rule for 1,260 years. If we start in 538, when the Pope was made the head of all churches, given not only ecclesiastical but political power, you count down 1,260 years, you will come to 1798. 1,260 plus 538 gives you your total, 1798. What happened in 1798? Here's the answer right out of the encyclopedia. Quote, in 1798, he, Berthier, that's Napoleon's general, Berthier, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one, end of quote. He actually took the pope into exile. The pope died in exile. What year? 1798, a perfect fulfillment of the prophecy, 1260 years from 538 to 1798. You talk about an amazing fulfillment. Let's go now to our 11th one, number 10 also fit. We saw that. Let's move to number 11, based in Rome. Of course, we know Vatican is based in Rome. Revelation 13, 2, the dragon gave him his power and his seat. And great authority. Notice this statement from a professor of history. This is the professor of history at the University of Rome, Professor Labanca. He said, quote, To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his what? His seat to the pontiff. End of quote. I thought that was an amazing fulfillment of the prophecy. So you can see tonight that all 11 points fit the Vatican kingdom. Now remember, we're not talking about Catholic people. I hope you can still keep the difference. We're talking about a kingdom tonight. Don't forget that. And we can see which kingdom meets those points. The Bible told us in Revelation 13, verse 3, I saw one of his heads wounded to death. That happened in 1798 when they took the Pope, Pope Pius VI, into exile. He died in exile. The French said there would never be another Pope. But the Bible said, and his deadly wound was healed. When did the wound heal? Here's the answer. 1929. And even the news showed this. Headline news, San Francisco Chronicle, Mussolini and Gaspari sign historic Roman pact. And in the article it said this, quote, The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy, because Italy was restoring its property back to the Vatican. Reading on it says, In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, doing what? Healing the wound. Extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. The Bible said, His deadly wound was healed. What year? 
1929. And by the way, it was echoed in other newspapers as well. Wound healed. And of course, today, we realize as world leaders go to the Vatican for counsel, for direction, that indeed the wound has healed. Now, here's something interesting. When you study Revelation 13, you will see that there are two beasts in Revelation 13. The beast that comes up out of the sea, we have discovered tonight, is a symbol of the Vatican Kingdom. Not talking about Catholic people. Vatican Kingdom. Many Bible scholars believe that the beast that comes up out of the earth, that's the second beast in Revelation 13, is the symbol of the United States of America. And I also agree with that in interpretation. Of the two nations, Vatican and America, which one is more powerful? Watch this. Here is when Benedict visited America. Notice who is standing very straight and who is bowing ever so slightly. American president bowing to the pope. And I want you to take a careful look at what color the pope's shoes are. Can you see what color he's wearing there? Blood red. I'm going to show you later this coming week why he chooses to wear blood red shoes. It's actually been explained by a professor from Notre Dame University, Catholic University. He tells why he wears blood red shoes. It's amazing. Here is another picture of our current president. There you see the two world leaders, the two kingdoms. Notice who is bowing to who. Which one is more powerful then? I think it's very amazing. Vatican is the most powerful nation on the face of the globe today. So we have discovered tonight that the beast of Revelation 13 is a symbol of the Vatican kingdom. Not talking about Catholic people. We're talking about a kingdom. You probably are wondering about that number, 666. What about 666? We're going to add 666 as our 12th clue to our list. Let's read about this from Revelation 13, verse 18. This is going to be our final clue. Revelation 13, 18 talks about 666. So we're putting that as our 12th clue. Revelation 13, 18 says, Here is wisdom. Am I ahead of you? Are you there, Revelation 13? Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 300, three score, and six. That's 666. Now, I want to clarify tonight, 666 is not the mark of the beast. You heard correctly. 666 is not the mark of the beast. 666 is the number of the beast. We will study about the mark of the beast tomorrow night. You don't want to miss it. It's amazing. 666 is not the mark of the beast. It is the number of the beast. And I want to prove that to you from the Bible. You're in Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 15. We'll read verse 2. Revelation 15, verse 2. And we'll see here four issues. Revelation 15, 2 says, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, there's one issue, over his image, second issue, over his mark, third issue, we'll look at that tomorrow night, and over the number of his name, fourth issue, stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So the number of his name is what? 666. Let me give you another text. Revelation 13, 17. Revelation 13, 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. What's the number of his name? 666. So the mark of the beast is separate from the number of the beast. We're going to look at the number of the beast tonight, 666. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at the mark of the beast. Before I show you the number of the beast, let me give you the origin of 666. You're looking at, in the picture, a photograph of the tomb of Pope Sixtus. There were five popes who named themselves Six. Interesting. Let's look at a, a get a close-up of his crown. I don't know if you can see this in the lighting here. But if you look carefully at his crown, 
this tomb for Pope Sixtus, you will see on the crown six entwining serpents beneath an occultic pyramid. Why would you have six serpents on the crown of a pope who named himself Six beneath an occultic pyramid? I'll tell you why. Because Six was a sacred number that was associated with the worship of the sun. Let me show you something else here. This is a photograph of some coins commemorating the sun. If you look carefully in the top coin, you can see the sun above the man there on the coin. And in the bottom coin, you will see the moon, and below it is the sun, and it actually says solus and loon, sun and moon. But on the back of these coins, you notice there's a set of mystic numbers. And we have them off to the side so that you can read them. There are six columns. If you add these columns up in any direction, you add them up vertically, they add up to 111. You add them up horizontally, they add up to 111. Add them up diagonally, they add up to 111. And there are six columns. When you have six columns, each adding up to 111, the total will be what? 666. And you can actually see 666 on this coin. If you look carefully there, the bottom of the coin, you will see 666 printed right on the coin. This is from antiquity. The reason why 666 was a number that was almost always associated with the worship of the sun. I think it's interesting, 6 is one less than 7. What is God's number? 7. What is God's day? The seventh day. I thought that was interesting. Man falls one short. 666. But notice the Bible says... Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a computer. Is that what it says? It's a number of a credit card. Is that what it says? It's a number of a barcode. What is it? It's a number of a man. Don't miss that. It's not the number of an implant or a microchip. Or a barcode. The Bible says it's the number of a man. But it's also the number of the beast. And Revelation 13, 17 says it's the number of his name. So when you put those three things together, it's the number of his name. It's the number of a man. It's the number of the beast. It would have to be then the number of the name of the man at the head of the beast's power. Right? Because it's the number of a man. It's the number of his name. And it's the number of the beast. So it would have to be the number of the name of the man at the head of the beast power. Is there a man at the head of the beast system? Yes, that's a pope. Does he have a name? Yes, he has an official title in Latin, which is, of course, the official language of Rome. Here is his official title. And by the way, I have a photocopy of this in my library, of this article. So this is legitimate. This is our Sunday visitor, April 18, 1915, where it says, quote, the letters on the Pope's mitre are these, vicarious filii Dei, which is Latin for vicar of the Son of God. What's vicar mean? Vicar means substitute for the Son of God. Let me show you from the concordance what the word anti actually means. Antichrist. What does anti mean in the original? Anti means, notice, substitution. So even his name identifies him for who he is. Vicarious filii Dei, vicar, or substitute for the Son of God. So many people were adding up the numerical value of the letters of his name and finding out what it added up to, that they actually removed that name from the crown. But every time a new pope is coronated, he's still called the Vicarious Filii Dei. That's one of his official titles. And the Bible told us we had to count the number in order to arrive at 666. What they would do, they would add up the numerical value of the letters in a person's name, and that would be the number of their name. The Bible talks about the number of his name. And you know that in Latin, certain letters have certain values, right? For example... Here's a clock. This clock has no numbers on it. 
It has Latin letters or Roman numerals. But we're familiar with those, right? For example, the I is how much? That's one. How about the V? That's five. And by the way, V and U are the same in Latin. Let me show you a picture of a museum. Notice the museum here. See how they spell it? V and U are exactly the same in Latin. So V or U is five. How about X? How much is that? That's 10. Let me quiz you a little farther. What about L? How much is that in Latin? That's 50. How about C? How much is... That's 100 in Latin. What about D? 500. So you're familiar with Latin. You know that in Latin, in Roman numerals, certain letters have certain values. We all know this. We grew up and we went to school. We, you know, they gave us those dates in Latin, and you had to translate them into numbers. So we're familiar with this. And the Bible says we had to count the number of his name. So we'll take the name, Vicarious Filii Day. We're going to add it up. V is 5. By the way, we're going to, you get this in your handout tonight, so you don't have to copy it. This will be part of your handout. V is 5, I is 1, C is 100. Some letters in Latin have no value. A has no value. R has no value. I is 1. V and U are the same in Latin, 5. S has no value, so there's 112. Filii, F has no value. I is 1, L is 50, I is 1, I is 1. There's 53. Day, D is 500, E has no value, I is 1, there's 501. When you add up the numerical total of his name, what's it add up to? Adds up to 666. And this is probably not coincidental. The ancient pagan emperors who believed themselves to be the representative of the sun god on earth, they would choose names that added up to 666 because that was the number of the sun solar worship. When the popes came along and inherited their power, their prestige from ancient Rome, they also chose names that would add up to that same sacred number, 666. And we simply add this as our final clue. If your name added up to 666, would that mean you are the Antichrist? No. You would have to also fit the other 11 points. It's almost as if God gives us one more bit of proof. It's like when you go looking for a house. Somebody tells you what color the house is, what the house looks like, what street the house is on, but then they give you the number of the house. Now you know you can find the house. And it's as if God has given us the number of the system so that we can know that indeed we have identified the right system. Now, I want to show you something, a statement from our current pope, the current pope. This is from Benedict. He said this back in 1992 when he was Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Quote, The Roman Catholic Church is wiser than the Bible, the Word of God, and is capable of contradicting it. End of quote. That's what the current Pope said. The Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, is wiser than the Bible, the Word of God, and is capable of contradicting it. And you can see how that's true when you compare the catechism with the Word of God. You can see the contradiction. The Bible itself says, Thy word is true from the beginning. God does not change. You cannot contradict the Word of God. If you are a Catholic, I want to encourage you, confess your sins to Jesus. There are many Catholics, and I want to say this tonight for you who are Catholics. There are many Catholics that are studying the Bible that are seeking to follow the Word of God, that are confessing their sins directly to Jesus. And so if you are a Catholic, if you're watching, if you're here, I want to encourage you to follow the example of the other Catholics that are making the Bible their guide and that are confessing their sins directly to Jesus. I know this topic tonight might have been sort of painful for some of you. You might be thinking, Pastor, this hurt tonight. The Bible says in Job 5, 17 and 18, Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Verse 18, For he, God, maketh sore and bindeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. You might feel tonight that this topic hurts you. 
But you can come to Jesus and say, Lord, I realize tonight what I've heard. Yes, it hurt, but I see that it's the truth. And I ask you, Lord, to bind up my pained heart. I want to make you my mediator. Confess my sins directly to you. Jesus said, John 8, 32, read with us. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yes, sometimes the truth hurts. You might be mad at the doctor tonight. You'll have to forgive me as the doctor. But I've shared with you the truth, and the truth will do what? The truth will make you free. Whether you're a Protestant or whether you're a Catholic. Make the Bible your foundation and Jesus your priest. You can't go wrong if you do that. We're going to end our meeting tonight by singing a classic hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft to Me, Let Me Hide Myself in Thee. Let's stand together as we end our meeting singing this hymn. Rock of Ages, Cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy rim and side which all be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power, not the labors of my hands. heads as we pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this rock of ages, Jesus Christ, and that we can make him our mediator. We have been startled, some of us tonight, by the truth from your word. We recognize that your word is true from the beginning. We realize the truth will make us free. Pray your blessing on each one who's here and each one who's watching. Whether we be Protestants or Catholics, help us to make the Bible our foundation and Jesus Christ our mediator. Bless each one, we pray to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to join us in the morning, 10 o'clock, for Revelation's Gateway to a New Life. God bless you and good night.